I think that uh, the next thing we should discuss, there's been a, a basically a significant toxicity that's been seen. It's not a deal breaker, and we treat a lot of patients with brentuximab but uh, peripheral sensory neuropathy has been documented and been seen, and it actually requires at times dose reduction or stopping the agent. And I was just wondering um, what are your experience has been basically with this peripheral sensory neuropathy and how, how we actually would treat these patients, maybe starting out with a NOS. Right, so the initial um, um, uh, pivotal trials that w was conducted in patients with, with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, mm -hmm. and many patients had multiple pr prior treatment regimens. Mm -hmm. There's no limit on the number of pre-treatment regimens. So some of them had up to 10 prior treatment regimens, right. although the median was about three. So not surprisingly that some of these patients received a BVD, platinum-based regimen, and other neurotoxic agents. So the, the incidence of neuropathy was, uh, was significantly higher than what you would expect with other investigational agents. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that it is a cumulative, it, and it takes longer time to get uh, the neuropathy. But when you stop the treatment, modify the dose, or make dose interruptions, it, it can get better. But you're not supposed to wait until it gets significant neuropathy because you don't want to wait until grade three or four or you get motor neuropathy. Once you get grade two or like slightly more than that, you should really make an action there by stopping treatment or modifying or making those interruptions for the neuropathy to improve. But most of the times it's manageable. And I guess there has to be, it's a learning curve and there's some caution because some <coughs> physicians and Phil, and I've had this question, is, is it similar to the Kristen associated peripheral neuropathy? And I don't know if we can't really make that statement at this point. It's a different drug a different age, and I think that comes also into play when we've utilized uh, basically um, bortezomib, and the bortezomib-associated peripheral neuropathy, uh, at early on, people would just keep pushing the dose, but then I've actually even had experience where that neuropathy does not reverse very effectively and sometimes can be permanent. So I'm not sure that's the same here with the brentuximab vodotin, but I think we do have to have some air of caution. I was just gonna say, what about other adverse events that have been either we've experienced uh, as our, in our patients or have been mentioned in literature. I'll ask you, Steve, have you seen any other toxicities or any toxicities that we should be aware of and for the practicing clinician? Yeah, I think the one thing that's come to light recently is there's a handful of cases of pancreatitis that have developed, uh, shown up in some of the clinical trials. Um, it's not clear whether these patients were predisposed to that, but it's been noted. We think pancreas cells have some, some low expression of CD30, so it's not impossible that that's a true side effect and not just coincidental. Um, Again, we don't use that in terms of deciding who to treat, uh, but uh, more of a sense now that if patients develop abdominal pain or nausea or some unexpected symptoms, then we, we might look at lipase earlier and sort of pay attention to that. Um, it's a few cases out of a few thousand patients, a lot of it in sort of post-marketing reports, but I think it's something that we're paying attention to now, particularly on trials. Thank you. Lauren, any other uh, thoughts? I think, I think two things. I've seen some uh, degree of alopecia it's a little bit more than what I expected in the package insert, and while it's certainly not a deal breaker either, I think we need to set the patient's expectations appropriately. Um, the other thing that intrigues me is the few cases of PML that have been reported. CD30 is a, a very specific target, but we have to realize that it does happen in normal situations, and particularly in lymphocytes that are fighting viruses. And so there may be some particular link with this drug and PML, and it, it goes to a little bit maybe what Steve said about the um, increased activity in AILT, a particular T-cell lymphoma that's very closely related to Epstein-Barr virus and often has CD30 expression as well, even in the microenvironment as well as the tumor cells, that perhaps when we treat those patients, we're not totally just treating the tumor cells, but are somehow altering the microenvironment in an effective way. Are you, or would you be concerned with respect to, say, patients reactivating uh, zoster, perhaps, and would you actually use a cyclovir prophylaxis in your patients that are on brentuximab vodotin? I don't think so, and, and that really hasn't been an, an issue. Mm -hmm. Steve? Yeah, not a single agent. You know, I think in some of the studies where we're combining with more aggressive chemotherapy regimens, post-transplant, et cetera, it's a, it's a different patient population, and, and a lot of those people are already on. Can I add one thing, uh, 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 Myron? So the issue back here to what we said about cleavable, non-cleavable, mm -hmm. so there is a bystander effect. So for example, in AILD, where the EBV positive bystander B cells express CD30, they may give actually therapeutic advantage because then you're even not targeting tumor cells, you can still have some bystander effect, and that should be kept in mind. Mark, can I ask uh, my colleagues if you guys have any experience of uh, any anti-neuropathy agents for prophylaxis of treating like gabapentin? It's a very frequent question I get from community physicians, whether you prophylax or you treat, or how do you approach that? 
I treat it when it comes for comfort, but I've never uh, used that as prophylaxis or actually, frankly, thought about that as a prophylactic drug. But We haven't uh, used prophylaxis. We try something out of sort of uh, hoping to help with Neurontin and other things, but I'm not so sure about scientific data that is helping. We try it anyways, but I don't know if it helps. It, it's never occurred to me. I, that's a question I very frequently get from the community. And I'd like to emphasize, um, I think it's very important what uh, Anas pointed out, that neuropathy with brentoximab, we don't, not something that sneaks up on you, and physicians need to be ready for it. And if you're ready and patients are aware, it's much easier to manage. Because in our studies in anaplastic lymphoma and T-cell lymphomas, the median time to onset was four to five cycles. Median time to severe neuropathy was seven, nine cycles. So it's a cumulative effect. So you capture it earlier, you adjust the dose, sometimes the schedule, you potentially, actually in more than half the patients, you're able to avoid severe neuropathy and keep patients on very active agents. I guess the only issue is that when you have a heavily pretreated patient who, for example, I've had a patient that felt both, you know, autologous and an allogeneic transplant, and you have an agent that's finally working, it's so difficult to stop something if it starts progressing. It's a really a hard debate between the benefit and risk ratio, but it, hopefully there'll be other agents coming soon that we'll be uh, testing. Yeah, no, I was just going to add to that. I think we've seen that pretty clearly in some of the skin lymphoma studies where you take patients with the relapsed aggressive T-cell lymphomas with few other options. There's often a desire by the patient and the physician to stick with it a little longer, where patients with earlier in the disease course who have lots of options, uh, uh, you may hold earlier for early toxicity. But, but thankfully, we know that we can retreat patients. So that, that would be reassuring to such a patient that perhaps they could have a holiday, um, regain or reverse some of the neuropathy, and then have an opportunity to have the same agent again. And I think the only caveat there, and, and, and it has to be clear, is that that works as long as the patient was responding to the agent when you stopped it. That if you stop the agent, there's no miracle that happens that if you stopped it, they recover when they were progressing, that suddenly they're going to respond. I've never seen that happen. There's no reports of that. Also. Right. It should not be re used as retreatment if you have progression of disease on therapy. There's no data about that. I think some... Uh...